Hello world, welcome back to the PG.biz podcast. I'm your host, Brian Baglow, and joining me as always is the Empress of Events, the Globetrotter herself, Miss Peggy Ann Saltz. Hello, Peggy. How do we find you today? I am feeling just great, Brian, and I always wonder how you manage to do that. You are unique every single time, every single show, and that is a whole year that we've been doing this now. I know. Our first anniversary. It's We should have had cake. <laughs> Well, PG, connect, right? London, it's a date. It's a date. We will do that in person. Yes. Yeah. It's In fact, I think the first time we met was, was a mobile event, maybe even the Mobile Entertainment Forum back some scary number of years ago. So I know, I know. Before your beard, Brian. <laughs> it was very definitely pre-beard and it was back when I was a stunning blonde. Um, we should save the misty reminiscence for when we actually meet Peggy, but... Um, but yeah, a year already, and uh, and this is of course then, this makes it our first show of 2024, so a very happy new year to you as well. Absolutely, and what better way to kick it off than to do a SWOT analysis of the tactics, the alternative tactics, the tactics you can and should take advantage of in 2024, and who better to delve into the strengths and weaknesses of these various UA channels both old and new, then Matt Conlon, who is co-founder and chief customer officer at Fluent. Matt oversees sales, marketing, and business development at Fluent, which is an industry leader in user acquisition. Again, that overview. It's fantastic to have you, Matt. Peggy, Brian, thank you so much for having me today. It is my pleasure to ring in the new year with the two of you. It's it's good to have you here, Matt. And and user acquisition is something that we that keeps coming up time and time again on this show. When no matter who we're speaking to, what sort of company they come they, they come from, and the position they hold within that company, UA is just one of the big big challenges. Let's let's start with a little bit about you, Matt. You've been at Fluent for thirteen years, which is a fairly fairly impressive track record record in itself. And so you will have seen a lot of changes in that time, a lot of changes, a lot of pivots, a lot of evolution both in the company and the industry. As we kick off 2024, first show of the year, um, all of the new tools, tech, trends, emerging channels, alternative app stores, what are you guys at Fluent watching most closely and with the most interest and why? And yes, this is our predictions for 2024 section. Yeah, yeah, great. Yeah, I think, Brian, that's an awesome question to start off the new year with. Yeah, there's no doubt. Being in the gaming ecosystem for a decade plus and digital marketing for 20 plus years, You've seen a lot. You have to pivot a lot. I think what I'm most excited about is it's 2024. The new year always brings about new possibilities and new opportunities. And I think as, as marketers and creators and developers, it also is an opportunity to solve new puzzles and new challenges. You know, I think the overarching theme that we saw in 2022 in the back half going into 23 was a huge shift from growth at all costs to growth with ROAS as the primary metric and KPI set that marketers were looking at. I think the CMOs and the CFOs of organizations started saying, the economy is changing, it's tightening, and we need to be more profitable faster. And so over the course of last year, we saw the KPIs of most marketers change pretty dramatically. And I would anticipate in 2024, the thing that we're keeping a close eye on is how those metrics continue to evolve and how marketers really start to shift focus towards a shorter payback window and seeing healthier D7, D30, D180 uh, performance. And so, you know, we see a lot of our clients really leaning into getting better utility out of every single dollar that they put to work across all the various channels. The obvious one that we have to touch on is recently Epic won a, a pretty epic uh, court case against Google. Don't mind it. I apologize for the pun. But, you know, this is going to change the game, right? So not only is privacy uh, <laughs> continuing to evolve, but now so is the App Store economy. And by the way, 2023, I think the EU passed the Digital Markets Act. And Apple just had to disclose in November that they are allowing third-party app stores onto the devices in 2024, right? So you've got now a whole proliferation of opportunities and new challenges to start to solve for. Now, as a mobile marketer, I have to think about which channels I'm going to market on. 
the tried and true Google, Facebook, AppLovin, Unity, Iron Source. I've got all these alternative channels that we've been championing for a long time. Um, but now I was gonna, I got to figure out which app store do I want to acquire users through, right? And this is all very new, but now I have an opportunity to drive users through iOS, Android, through the Microsoft Store. <laughs> the cross promotion of how you publish an app, I think, will be a big topic for developers. And I think a trend that we'll want to keep a really close eye on this year is if if you're a developer, the epics of the world have created an interesting playbook that you're going to see a lot of fast followers start to go after. I can create my own app store and allow my best, most valuable users to engage directly with the, a store that I've created for them. Wow. Okay. And and that was question number one. So I think we can kind of encapsulate that and say that the, the one constant in the games market is change. I would say that all these changes are good for the both the developer and the consumer because at the end of the day, consumers want choice, right? All these changes, especially the, uh, the soon-to-be proliferation of you know third-party alternative app stores will create that choice. And now consumers can look at when I'm engaging with these app stores, what has the best user experience? A lot of the, the, the UX and the design has been pretty much the same for over a decade. So with the introduction of new app stores, is there new feature sets that become available, new way of displaying games and displaying a lot of the different elements of that game itself? And so I'm excited to see how consumers and developers alike will benefit from the changes that we just discussed in 2024 and, and beyond. Phenomenal. Because it, it seems as though that more and more of the power is coming back to the creators. You know, it, it's giving them more to do. It's not just make a great game and you're set for life. It's make a great game find your players, keep your players. It's like build your own app store. You know, we, we, we spoke to, uh, we've spoken to companies in the past who are already building the platforms to allow you to create your own app stores. You know, so it seems as though more and more of the, the opportunity is flowing back to the, is to the developers. Are you seeing the development community, you know, a, a, appreciating this? The value add will go both ways. These new app stores and developers that create their own uh, app environments will, have a great appreciation for how challenging it is to create kind of rich content and, and kind of easy to use features. There's a lot of thought, resource, energy, and money that goes into creating incredible retail experiences. And now game developers that have had one main focus is create great games that engage my my players for you know extended period of time. Now I have to think about how to create retail environments that keep them coming back and make sure they're populated with all the right types of products and features. And that's not a light lift. So Matt, from everything you're saying, the options and opportunities are multiplying at a huge rate and changing very, very quickly. Um, and the perception of these options are, are going to be changing just as just as fast. But one real obvious one is the is the value of an incentivized player. You know, there are mechanisms in place to increase their numbers, their loyalty to a game. Are they working still? And can you tell us what's the profile of an incentivized player and what do they bring to the game? Great question, Brian. So no longer is there a stigma around leveraging rewarded platforms to acquire uh, new users. That narrative is long since sailed. And you know, some of the largest game developers in the world leverage rewarded discovery and loyalty rewarded ecosystems um, to to drive new players. It's all to become kind of a, a critical piece of a healthy media mix, right? And, and I think it's also brought on by, frankly, saturation within some of the traditional channels. And I think there's also just a, a keen understanding that as mobile gaming as an industry starts to mature, it has to leverage tips and tricks from more mature industries. I mean, just look at uh, credit cards, airlines, you know, the, the quick service restaurants, every single one of the, the industries that have been around for 20, 50, 100 years leverages rewards and some sort of point mechanism to keep consumers loyal. Now that marketers are waking up to the idea that I can identify not only an incremental user, right? Somebody who's net new, I, I wouldn't have picked up in some of my traditional marketing environments. But this is a user that is, is end up being loyal to my game. And so I think what we're excited about is the positive feedback we get from game developers around the power of getting a, a rewarded user because there's great quality there. There's great LTV. We did a, a survey of several thousand consumers recently. And one of the interesting data points that came out of this survey of consumers was that 65% of users that came from a rewarded uh, experience 
have made an in-app purchase, right? So this is a user that's coming in, they're making a purchase, they're reaching certain events and levels, and they're playing that game. It creates an opportunity for consumers to discover the game and for developers to show how great their game is. Because once they're in there, they're making that first purchase, they're getting further into the game, they let the game mechanics take over. So it creates that, that really unique kind of value exchange. And I think there's a crazy data point here that I, I just I, I have to share. The users that come from rewarded platforms are 50% more likely to make in-app purchases than non-rewarded users. Part of that's because they have a compelling reason to. They're commonly being rewarded with some sort of currency, a gift card opportunity, or, or earning potential. And so they're more likely to make an in-app purchase and start to play that game. It's a really critical part of a healthy media mix. Also, when you talk about the profile, you know, one of the interesting things we see is that the, you know, the, the game developers that get it are able to bid $20, 30 $40 for an install for uh, users that come from you know, rewarded discovery platforms like those offered by Fluent. And those types of bid rates are comparable with the non-rewarded ecosystems, right? So you, and the only way they can confidently bid at those levels is if they're seeing compelling LTVs, if they're seeing the retention that they would come to expect, and if they're seeing the progression through the gameplay. And so we get encouraged when we start to see the bid rates increase because we know we're providing value uh, to the ecosystem. The early metrics are always focused on the health of, you know, D7, D14, D30 ROAS. We're seeing more and more of our partners. They're looking at the, the, the 180 and 250 and 365 ROAS metrics and, and these users stick. And I think that's what's really changing the perception on how marketers can better leverage uh, reward ecosystems and drive users that come from, you know, I think what was previously thought of as alternative channel that maybe didn't drive the best quality user. I think that perception's changed. What I'm hearing here, and I'm going to piece it together, is that you're looking at 2024 and you're saying it's going to be about the business of games. Game devs are going to be retailers. Game devs are going to understand retail. And as you said yourself, what worked in other verticals. So Loyalty programs, point systems, rewarding, rewarded discovery is going to have a place or a higher place, but what is its place going to be in UA? Great question. So we think of the macro trend first, right? There's been a big shift away from growth metrics over to, you know, ROAS and, and driving better profitability and tightening that payback window. I think the marketers are looking for efficiency. What are efficient channels that can drive great value users, great value players? And so what we're starting to find is that rewarded discovery platforms are great at driving two key elements, highly efficient channels that are also very predictable. Of course, they need to be optimized like any other channel. You optimize for uh, better progression and, and better retention and, and um, and you, and you have to use all those levers that are available. But I think the other thing that markets are looking for in, in rewarded discovery platforms is, uh, incrementality. And we, we like to think about is how do you identify the non gamer gamer? The consumer that doesn't self identify as a gamer, but plays, plays mobile games five to 10 plus hours per week on their commute. Uh, when they have downtime at home. And I think what we find is these rewarded platforms bring to bear those incremental users that aren't already in the ecosystem. So it gives marketers new ponds to fish in when they're thinking about reaching new consumers. And a, a really consistent trend we hear and a theme we hear from a lot of our, our larger game developers is we're looking for incrementality, right? I don't want to pay a premium for a user I could have gotten somewhere else. I'm already fully saturated across the mainstay channels. How can you drive me an incremental user that, that I wouldn't have seen otherwise? You see that as a really important point. This kind of goes directly to the whole privacy kind of challenge that all the markers are working through is the value exchange, right? And, and what we're finding is that within these reward ecosystems, consumers oftentimes are asked to allow the app to track, right? You have to allow the app to track because they're going to be rewarded for the more they play, the more levels they reach, and 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 they'll earn credits towards thing real world 
uh, gift cards and, and so on and so forth. But as long as there's a clear value exchange for the consumer, the consumers get great value out of those games. The game developers see great value. And so I think that's where I think rewards becomes a true pillar, a tent pole, if you will, in the mobile app marketers media mix. And it all goes back to the, the efficiency, making every dollar work harder. Let's kind of move on to the sort of the, the real kind of uh, crown jewels here, Matt. You, you you promised us a SWOT analysis. First, a SWOT for the rewarded ecosystem, right? So if you're if you're a mobile game developer and you're going to leverage uh, some of the rewarded uh, loyalty platforms out there, or discovery platforms that are out there, I'd say biggest strength access to incremental audiences, right? That's number one. Your boss is going to be very happy with the fact that you're introducing new audiences, new gamers to your game. Number two on the strength side is efficiency. So now if I can efficiently acquire the non-gamer gamer who is going to be playing my game, making the purchases and, and value add, that's a big strength. On the weakness side is there's a different LTV curve, right? And you have to kind of model for that separately. And, uh, you know, frankly, these consumers behave differently. There's some adjustments that need to take place to your models to ensure that you're appropriately pricing this type of inventory. On the opportunity side you know, there's, there's rapid growth potential, there's scale, there's, you know, incredible quality that can be derived. And that's only going to increase as more and more uh, overall dollars go into that ecosystem. And uh, I think from a threat perspective is, is the obvious around privacy regulation, right? There, there's potential for more privacy changes. But, you know, as we talked about, when there's a clear value exchange and consumers are winning, which in this case they are, I think it it makes a very compelling case for why you know that big threat around you know uh, continued privacy regulations um, being less of a concern. As part of that, let's let's have a little look at um, you know one aspect of this in terms of influencer marketing because you know so social continues to have a an, a major impact. Some would say a, a vastly you know uh, over important impact, but it's the number two place where players discover new games, and so we know it's got a own share of strengths and weaknesses. Social is emerging as a new search channel, right? And and younger generations are are using social to discover new products and new games. If you look at social through that lens, um, it starts to change your perception of how to leverage influencers to drive um, to drive behavior and drive adoption of your of your product. And I think there's a, there's a great data point that uh, Statista dropped, which was 55% of Gen Z and 57% of millennials think social is better than online search for learning about new products. Wow. That trend is only going to continue, right? So you're, you're talking about in the next couple of years, 60, 70% of the younger generations will use social exclusively to find about, out about new products, right? So I think that's a, a trend that you need to get ahead of. And start to develop your own influencer strategy to stay ahead of that curve. I think the other point is that influencer marketing is clearly leading the way when it comes to discovery. I think any major game developer has a very large uh, influencer and creator management team. They're developing deep partnerships with creators to drive the adoption. You saw this with, with Monopoly Go. You saw this with a number of uh, Moon Actives titles like Coin Master. You, and so I think you're, you're seeing this with a lot of large titles uh, is is they're leveraging influencer in a smart way because they know it works. Even to that matter, rethinking it completely because they're using micro influencers or even even potentially AI. Well, interesting point about micro influencers is we find that um, micro and nano, so influencers that have under typically five million followers, actually have a more engaged user base. Right? When you're talking about the macro or mega creators and influencers, they have such a big following. People just follow to follow. But when you've got that smaller following, they're going to be more uh, likely to engage with the product recommendation or a game recommendation. So we've really started to focus our efforts internally uh, when it comes to driving discovery for, for our game partners around that. Uh, that micro and, and nano influencer base, especially for driving performance, right? We're not talking about brand. From a brand perspective, you want to go mega all day. But if you want to drive performance metrics, drive outcomes in terms of installs and players that play, we find that micro and nano works really well. You know, the SWOT analysis on, on influencer quickly is strength. It's where the eyeballs are. People are spending more and more time on these platforms than ever before. It's where consumers are. 
the weakness, frankly, is, is attribution. And, uh, you know, there's, there's a lot of challenges with, with making sure you're clear on which creators drove the outcomes. And I think that's, that's part of the, the challenge is making sure you have the right media mix model that, that can, that can successfully work in the creator and influencer space. I think the big opportunity as we go over time is aligning with relevant creators that meet your brand, right? Those that you can that build trust for your product and drive a more engaged user. Uh, and that, that takes time, right? To do the, the research and find the creators that best align with your product. The big threat is, of course, brand safety, right? You're, you don't have as much control over messaging, which is why you have to invest into a influencer and a creator team that can hold the hands of these creators, make sure that they know what to say and not to say and how to keep the brand um, promise and the brand message at the forefront. And you showed this also in your data that I saw during the webinar that social was the number two place, right? Where players discover new games. So, you know, Peg, it's a great point because almost all game developers today uh, and marketing teams are spending on the platforms themselves. So as a way to augment those spends with these social platforms, to not have a social strategy or an influencer strategy is a miss because it's essentially a way to bypass the toll booth, if you will, right? You can either pay the toll booth at the platform level or you pay the influencers directly. A balanced mix is really important, to, you know, because it, clearly it's where consumers are and it drives great discovery. It, it's a fascinating point, Matt. As somebody who goes back, you know, I, I uh, technically I'm a journalist right now, but I started off doing PR and it was the difference between... Um, you know, the media, the proper media and uh, people running their own websites. So the very early days of blogs, you know, the blogs were getting more eyeballs, but the credibility came from the media, the magazines, you know, the broadcast channels. And of course, now that's that's all been flipped and it's that curation, but it's that trusted content, as you say. And if you can form th that relationship, then you can you can have uh, an incredibly valuable source who is telling people you should play this game, unlike the app stores where you go and for all the money that you're spending, you're simply being seen alongside all of the other people who are, you know, hopefully also shaping their own marketing messages to say, our game's great. So it's it's a smart move. That's right. And, you know, exactly. regardless of the threat, I think everybody's going to have to have to get on board with this. If you're counting this up in your head, Brian, you're saying, OK, game devs, they have to have their store, understand retail, understand the science of rewards and uh, manage these agencies and the nano influencers or, you know, it's it's a lot on their plate. From my perspective, um, Peggy, I think it's one where it puts the power back in their hands. You know, they can work with agencies, they can work with publishers, they can work with lovely companies like Fluent, Matt, obviously, um, and we highly recommend them. It becomes an informed choice. You know, do we want to do this or do we just want to make a game? But but for me, it's being able to shape not just your game, but the, the storefront, the messages that are going out across the board about this. So it, it's a hugely powerful um, system. It might be intimidating, but wow. This is a whole new era in terms of curating that entire experience for your players. Great way to get to another difference. So we're talking about a whole new era in what you can do with your game. Well, you also have to understand that the landscape is very different. And we got a little bit of a treat here because Matt didn't just come and say, hey, I've got a SWOT analysis for you. No, he also is looking at the landscape. And Matt, you have a new kind of mobile landscape. I saw it on your blog. I've been studying it ever since because what I found was really intriguing about it is you have sort of like mainstream, the way things were up to maybe 2020 three-ish, definitely 2024, and the alternative UA channels beyond. Walk me through this mobile landscape because it's not just a grouping. It's going to help me shape my strategy. If you take a step back, what we've discussed so far is that mobile uh, marketers are looking for uh, new channels, new solutions, new ways to engage consumers. And and what we're finding now as a result of that is a proliferation of companies coming up with great ways to engage consumers and provide value to the mobile game developers. And, and of course, they're probably looking at how successful many of the mainstays have been over the years and saying, you know what, I've got an idea that I think I can bring to market as a unique value proposition that brings value to the ecosystem. And so within the mainstream channels, you have the duopoly, you have the major DSP players that are just dominant forces within the, the mobile game ecosystem. They're reliable, but they're also saturated. There's a point of diminishing returns where you can no longer invest more money and get valuable users out. 
right? There is a point where you reach a ceiling and you're targeting either the same users, the same places, and you're not reaching that net new. And that's frankly where what we call the alternative channel, alternative UA channels have started to become a much more important part of the mix is uh, it helps to broaden the reach, frankly, right? I can reach new users. You know, I think many years ago, do you remember this? There was a point where if you were to get a user off mobile web, it was just a no-go because you couldn't pass IDFA. I remember this. We thought we were a pioneer and we had a lot of our developers like, wait, you, you can't pass me IDFA? I don't trust it. And now we're finding that mobile web has its place because it does reach a different audience than might already be playing a game and, and seeing some of the rewarded video content and so forth. That's uh, pretty prevalent within the game community. But what we're finding, though, is that by promoting games on, on mobile web environments or other kind of non-app um, settings, marketers are able to reach and convert those casual gamers and newcomers uh, who spend more of their time on open web and, and different environments. There's a lot of new companies that are investing into innovative approaches that are thinking outside the box and, and they're doing a great job of, of helping bring a new generation of gamers into the ecosystem and, and helping these mobile marketers reach brand new consumers that are providing great value. It's looking great now, but you could make it something that would go on our walls like in the old days, remember, with the, the whole ecosystem, because you brought it up yourself. We've got Rewarded, we've got Influencer, and the Emerging Channel itself, which will be the alternative app stores. Just as a thought, not that we want to extend the mobile landscape out too far, but you're watching everything, Matt. You've been there, done that. We talked about the, at the top of the show. Is there something that we're not talking about that we should have on the radar? Maybe not on the chart, but definitely on the radar to unlock those new audiences. Yes. Yeah, great question. So sneak preview. Okay. We've interviewed industry experts uh, for their 2024 uh, predictions for the mobile app ecosystem. And we're able to solicit feedback from a number of awesome partners. And so I, I was able to get insights from folks outside of the Fluent Walls, which was really helpful. But I think a couple themes that started bubbling up. Number one is because we're, we're moving away from deterministic targeting, I think we're going to see a rise in um, contextual targeting. And I think marketers are going to be looking for different ways to reach consumers in contextually relevant environments. One of the other big themes we're going to see emerge as a part of that, though, is I think we're going to find a lot of uh, mobile game developers are going to be prioritizing the collection of first party data and first party insights so that they can become more powerful in how they reach consumers where they are. Uh, and I think that notion of creating your own first party insight, investment into a CDP and, and understanding who your customers are will help them reach consumers on the right channels uh, more effectively. I think there's going to be a push towards what we'll call even more non-traditional channels. We've seen a surge in connected TV, podcasts, hi hyper-local events. I would say that one emerging channel that we're keeping a really close eye on is commerce media. So directly after uh, the transaction moment, is there a relevant opportunity for game developers to participate in that ecosystem, right? Somebody who just purchased a, a flight, hey, need something to do while you're traveling? download this new game, right? I think there's there's some really interesting pockets of inventory and it's on us as marketers to just get creative, right? There is a, a sea of opportunities to reach new consumers and reach your existing. And so just getting creative with where you might be able to find it. So I will say there will be no shortage of new channels that will be tested this year from the savvy mobile game uh, developers that exist. That is amazing. Challenging, challenging, Brian. But I mean, if you think about it, it makes such sense because retail is everywhere in all sorts of sizes. So it makes, makes total sense. Feels very, very optimistic. Little, 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 little stressful, little overwhelming, but definitely optimistic. So, uh, thanks for that, Matt. I'm still blown away, have to say. I think mind blowing is, is the way to put it, Matt. There, there's a huge amount in this. I can see a lot of people listening to this multiple times. So. Everyone we have here, we also look at them as people because everyone is more than a title, right? Now, we see your background, and I looked at and I said to myself, I think of one word. I think of rock. Not because you're rock, not because this was really cool, and we learned a lot, but you're also solid like a rock. You know, your company, you've been with your company. Your company's gone through changes, pivots, partnerships. Tell us how you've sort of 
maneuvered and navigated this past and maybe leave our audience with a little bit of advice about how you deal with rapid change. You've done it already, Matt, and they're going to have to do it because the world is their oyster. Yeah, you're, you're right. We founded Fluent in 2010 and uh, it has been an absolutely wild ride, one that I wouldn't change for the world from uh, getting acquired in 2015 to spinning ourselves out two years later to the products we've developed and pivoted away from to those that we've invested further into to the incredible team members I've had the privilege of working with and partners we've had the privilege of servicing. I think one thing that's helped us you know, manage through the tough times and the good times is an adage that we hold quite dear here at Fluent, which is what one does in the face of adversity ultimately determines their destiny. It's true in business and it's true in life. And frankly, you know, if some of these changes weren't coming about, new things would not be created, right? And so I, I, I love the constant change and I think it gives way to innovation and has created a great career for so many awesome people to keep, keep driving change. And I can see you at that helm, Matt. I can see you at that helm. Exactly. So there's a reason the, the, the tagline for the show is, is listen, learn, love. And I think uh, there's a lot, a lot that they're going to have to listen to, but uh, there's so much in there to love. So, Matt, thank you so much. We're not going to keep you much longer. We we ask every guest two final questions before we we send them off yes. to get on with their day. Um, and it comes back to games because everything does. Uh, the first is, what are you playing right now? What's obsessing you? What's burning a hole in your pocket if it's a mobile game right now? And the second one, favorite game of all time. Oh boy. Okay. Um... What am I obsessing over right now? We do a lot of work in the casual game, adventure, match three. So I have played them all, absolutely obsessed with the Monopoly goes and Coin Masters and, and Royal Matches. And, and those are all incredible titles. But I recently was uh, QAing the survival space because one of our uh, longtime friend and development partners is building a new one. So I got hooked on Survivor.io. Oh, which is, yeah. I, I don't know how often that gets brought up, but it is wildly addicting and uh, playing way, way too much of it. Oh, yeah. No, it's the, <laughs> the, the IO games are, are, are kind of uh, not one that, not ones that come up very often, but I'm with I, you. I, I bet I it does with it. you. And then as far as favorite of all time, this is going to date me a bit, but uh, Gameloft used to create this series called Modern Combat, and they had... Uh, this one title is a first-person shooter called Modern Combat 5. That was probably one of the best games. It was the graphics. It was so ahead of its time. I was surprised that they could get this level of gameplay into a mobile device back in whatever that was, 2016, 2017. So those games don't even exist anymore, right? You have to you have to play against others. And so I, I miss those greatly. <laughs> I had a blast playing those. I hear you. And as somebody who, who sucks enough not to want the multiplayer experience and is quite happy plugging yeah, along. Yeah, that's me. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it's. I'm. I'm. I'm quite happy. It's taking on the. It's the AI controlled monsters. It, it's. You know. At least I'm. I'm not getting called a dumbass every sort of <laughs> few deaths. More power to you. Same. Well, Matt, that 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 really has to bring us to an end of our time. So thank you again for your time. I think it has been honestly incredible. It just means we get you back on at some point in the near future, um, because. That, that that was, it was honestly astonishing. I'll just second it because it is also going to be one amazing article, maybe even a series over at Pocket Gamer. Yes. Well, this is about a whole new world. So thanks for opening our eyes to that. Yes, thank you guys. I appreciate it. This show is all about how to do your job better, how to make an amazing game, how to market it. And you have a say. So if you have a story or know someone we need to shine a light on, then we would love to hear from you. We want to hear from you. We want to reflect the reality of the mobile games market and all its wonderful complexity and strangeness. So if you have any suggestions for us, if you have any feedback for us, you can always get in touch. You can email us at podcast at pocketgamer.biz. You can find us on Twitter at pgbiz and you can reach out to us through the pocketgamer.biz website. If you're interested in listening to all of our podcasts, you can find them at pocketgamer.biz forward slash podcast. And we would love to hear your thoughts on future shows. And we've got you covered on all the major platforms. So subscribe to the audio podcast, as Brian said. Look for us on YouTube. If you want to read it, hey, you can do that too, because we have a companion 
post for you as well on the pocketgamer.biz website. Tune in again for the next edition of the pocketgamer.biz podcast and we look forward to speaking to you in the near future. Until then, I'm Brian Baglow. I'm Peggy Ann Saltz and that's a wrap until next week. (laughs) 